Hey Lancers, I'm Paige Rollins from the Office of Alumni and Career Services and welcome to Career Chats Live. I'm so excited to welcome alumni Catherine byers Brief from the class of 1993 to talk about how to negotiate for what you're worth. Um, feel free to connect with us today on the tools on the bottom of your screen um, so you can answer some polls, ask Catherine live questions, and chat with your friends. So go ahead and tell us where you're watching this webinar from in the chat box on the bottom of your screen. You can also connect with us on social media at Longwood Alumni and by using the hashtag Career Chats Live. So I'm so excited to welcome Catherine Byers Brief, Chief Strike Changer and proud alumna. Thank you, Paige, and hello, Lancers. I am so excited to be here. I graduated from uh, Longwood, as Paige, Paige said, in 1993, and I'm actually a little embarrassed to tell you this is my first week back on campus. So uh, it's been so much fun, and I'm excited to talk to you today about money. It is such a hard topic, and most of us struggle with it. I'll admit that I've had some uh, horrible experiences over the years, but I've also learned how to negotiate very effectively, and I hope to give you the tools today, not just for getting your next promotion and your next job, but tools that you can use anywhere in your life. So, as Paige mentioned, we've got a chat box, we've got polls, and let's just run a quick little poll to get your fingers warmed up, because webinars can be really boring if it's just me talking at you, and I would love for you to participate. So let's launch that first poll. And it's up on your screen. So if you can just uh, tell me, how long do you think the average dollar bill lasts before they take it out of circulation? Just for giggles. Look at the votes rolling in. Fingers are working. This is good. Good start. All right, we can wrap that poll up. We've got almost an even split. Most of you think a dollar bill lasts 11.7 years. The correct answer is 5.8. So, um, the lowest votes were for 5.8. What that means, you can noodle on it over the weekend. So what did you really come here today to talk about? Negotiation. How to negotiate for what you're worth. I don't know about you, but when I was little, my parents told me that if I just worked really hard and kept my head down, I would be rewarded. They said that to me the first time I went in to negotiate for a babysitting job, and they said it to me as I was graduating from college, going out on job interviews. Well, I've got some news from my mom and dad. Dear mommy and daddy, that is a bunch of bunk. If you work hard and keep your nose down, you are not going to get paid what you're worth necessarily. In fact, I'm sorry to say it, it's unusual that an employer is going to say, oh, wow, we really value you. Let's, deep into, let's dip into our pocket and give you more money if you don't ask for it. So then the challenge becomes, what on earth do you do, and when and how do you go out and ask for what you're worth? Sorry, Mommy and Daddy, I'm sure you wouldn't improve in my language. So if you don't ask, you won't get. That is a lesson that I learned so painfully early on in my career. This is me as a rookie recruiter. So this was my very first job, uh, real job. When I left Longwood, I had a couple of, I wanted to go see the world. And so I was a... Uh, Bartender in Alaska, a camp counselor in California. I was a flight attendant, um, bartender in Seattle. So I had a whole bunch of fun jobs, but salary was all non-negotiable, right? When you're a waitress, they pay you whatever they pay you. Bartender, same thing. Base salary, tips on top. Same thing for camp counselor. Um, and even flight attendant, this is what we're going to pay you, non-negotiable. So when I was interviewing for a job as a recruiter at a global IT consulting firm, I have to be honest with you, I was so excited about the opportunity and the people and helping people find their dream job. I didn't know a thing about interviewing. And when they asked me how much money I wanted to make, I said, gosh, I don't know. Whatever is fair market value, what do you typically pay? That's all I said. And they made me an offer that I was excited about. Base of 20, commissions on top, earning potential of 50K my first year. That's all I heard earning potential of 50000 my first year. And I thought, are you kidding me? I was making $15,000 as a flight attendant. So to me, I died and gone to heaven. I was so happy in my new job. I was having a ton of fun until I went out for drinks with another recruiter. She was the same age as me. She had the same amount of experience in recruiting, which was none. She tipped back a couple of glasses of wine and she said, 
can you believe they only paid us $25,000? I mean, really, as hard as this job is, we're working 70, 80 hours a week, I think I should have asked for 30,000. And $3,000 for a clothing allowance, I have like four suits, it's not enough. Well, I practically spit my wine out in her face because I didn't get a base of 25 and I got no clothing allowance. So she essentially got $8,000 more than me. I don't need to tell you emotionally what I went through that night and the weeks that followed. I finally screwed up the courage to talk to my boss. It took me about a month. So I sat down in Mark's office and I said, so Mark, I have kind of an uncomfortable question to ask you, but it's come to my attention that there are some other recruiters that have a higher base salary than me, and I would just like to know why. He leaned back in his chair and crossed his arms and said, they asked for it, and then he went back to work. And I stayed there, shell-shocked, and he said, is there something else? And I said, no, that's it, and I left his office. Now, you may be feeling sorry for me and sitting there thinking, what a scoundrel, what a rotten boss. But the truth is, he gave me the gift of a lifetime. He taught me a lesson that I never forgot. My mom and dad, bless their hearts, were wrong. And if I wanted to get paid what I was worth in this world, I need to go out and ask for it. Later on, um, a couple of months later, we were laughing about it. I will say, Mark didn't raise my base salary. He did toss in $1,000 for a clothing allowance for me. I think he was tired of seeing my one suit. Um, so I got a $1,000 clothing allowance, but he never raised my base salary. I ended up making great money on commissions and getting promoted to a director and getting a huge increase in my base, but not for two years. Um, he said, you needed to learn that lesson, not only for yourself, but even more importantly, as a recruiter who's negotiating salaries every single day. I needed you to understand what your clients are, how they're negotiate with you, and I need you to understand how badly your candidates are negotiated on their own behalf. Your job as a recruiter is to stand in between both camps and do good by both parties and facilitate and mediate and get both sides to come together in the middle. So 18 years later, thank goodness I've learned a lot about negotiation. I know that I can never go in not knowing what I want and having the confidence and courage to ask for it. So I'm curious, am I the only one who's had such an excruciating experience or have some of you lost the negotiation? So in the chat bar, in the chat bar here, I'm curious, have you ever lost an important negotiation that still makes you burn a little bit thinking back over it? So Paige, what have we got here? Oh, we've got people in Richmond and Alexandria. Fun. People are talking about those old school computers. Yeah. Ah. So, um, computers. The, old, uh, the picture of you. Oh, with my big monitor, the old school computers. Great. So, is anybody? Um, okay. So, Jason has lost negotiations. Um, absolutely, Dustin. Oh, so Dustin had a similar experience to me. He thought it was a great opportunity, but found out that somebody else got paid more money. It's horrible. It is horrible to find that out after the fact. And I'd like to tell you that's never going to happen to you again. The reality is, whether you're talking about a promotion, negotiating with vendors, whatever it is, at buying a new car, everything is negotiable. And you, no matter how well you negotiate, you're always going to find somebody who got a little bit of a better deal. I say, take a deep breath, have a nice cold Coke, learn from it, and work on sharpening your skills. Um, so Paige, let's launch our next poll, which is poll number two. And I want to know, how do you feel emotionally when you are stepping into a big negotiation? Again, whether it's a salary, a promotion, um, buying a house, what happens to you on the inside when you're stepping into the arena? Are you freaked out, completely freaked out? Are you somewhere in the middle, kind of nervous, but you think you got it under control? Or... Are you feeling like you're a pretty good negotiator and you're only here with us today to sharpen that saw just a little bit? Nice, to, nice for me to get a feel for the audience and where your um, confidence is around negotiations. Look at that, freaked out. Most of you are somewhere in the middle, which is good, so you've had some success. And then some of you are feeling, looks like about 30% or 10, 20%. 20% of you feel like you're really good negotiators. So those of you who are really great negotiators, please hop in the chat and share suggestions, tips, good experiences. We'd love to hear from you. So today, we're gonna tear me apart a little bit. 
we're going to take a look at that experience that I had as a rookie recruiter, an early 20 something, and tear apart what I did wrong. Number two, I want to um, put out for you the cost of apathy. So I just got to talk realistically with you the hard truth about if you fail to negotiate on your own behalf, what you stand to lose. Little incentive to get you to, to get into the game a little bit more. Um, number three, we'll cover just negotiation basics, and then I'll give you my five-point plan on how to get what you want. It works for me almost every time, um, and I've helped thousands of people negotiate uh, salaries, promotions, uh, even help a friend with a new house purchase. So um, what I'm going to teach you today is are things that I've learned the hard way, things that I've tested over and over and over again, and they really work for me. Um, and then I'll share a little bit with you in terms of what to say, because your language makes a big difference in terms of your success. So where did I go wrong? Well, my boss told me it was simply because I didn't ask for it. And that was the most important reason why I didn't get it. But there was more to it. So out of curiosity in the chat box, where do you think I went wrong in that negotiation? Aside from Nida asking for it, what else did I do wrong as that young, excited, enthusiastic person who just trusted that they would pay me what I was worth? What else did I mess up on? What do you think? Looking over here at the chat bar. And excellent. So Paige, what have we got? Didn't do research. So Jason said, I didn't do research. You're right. I didn't know you could do research. I didn't even know where to go to find out what recruiters get paid. I didn't even know what a recruiter was. Didn't know what recruiters get paid. Um, didn't do research. Over and over and over again. Yeah. So I didn't do my homework. I didn't know what I should have been asking for. But there were some other things I messed up on. Anybody got any ideas of what else I missed? Research. That's all right. That's why you're here. Okay, so I think there are five places that I screwed up. Confidence. There we go. I was hoping somebody was going to hit on it. So Nicole said, I didn't have the confidence. I didn't. I was a flight attendant. I'd never worked in an office, and I was surrounded by a whole bunch of people driving BMWs with $1,000 suits, successful, doing deals, and I just felt grateful that they thought I had a chance of success. So I didn't have the confidence to think that I even had a right to demand more money. Um, not being assertive, yes. So that's one big ball of wax. The insecurities guided my behavior around it. Um, so where I think I went wrong and where I've seen over and over and over again is I didn't know what I wanted. So even before doing research, I should have thought about what do I want, what do I need? See, as a flight attendant, my commuting money was really little. I only traveled to the um, airport maybe once, once or twice a week. I was all of a sudden commuting every single day. I, was, I needed more gas money. Um, as a flight attendant, I had one uniform. As a bartender, I had one uniform. Now, in a professional office environment, I needed at least five professional outfits. That costs money. So um, eating lunches out, I didn't calculate all of these things. My cost of living went up dramatically with this new job. So I should have sat down and figured out those sorts of things and figured out a base of 20000 was like my bare minimum. Um, number two, you guys nailed it. I didn't do research. I didn't know what I was worth in the market. Didn't know that I needed to look. Didn't know where to go look. Number three, I had no idea. The only motivators that I thought Mark had was, I want to give this girl a chance. I think she might be good. I didn't think it would pay more money for me because I felt like a risk. So I assumed that he was just kind of taking a risk on me and that I would get the lowest salary possible because of all of that. The truth is, I'd been a temp there for one week, and Mark had seen the way that I dealt with people on the phone and in person, and he saw tremendous potential, and he would have paid more for me. I didn't get that. I didn't understand that. Um, he was also attracted to me because of my network on both coasts, because I wasn't from Minnesota. I was brand new there, and so he thought it would be great for me to be able to tap my network in the broader United States. Um, number four, I didn't prepare for the conversation. I didn't prepare for the interviews at all. So I just, I winged it. I just, I didn't know what they were going to ask me. And I just handled every question as they came. A really bad idea. Um, and then number five, once they made me a job offer, I still could have recovered at that point. I could have gone out, done some research, talked to some people and figured out, should I go back and counter offer? Didn't occur to me. 
So those were my five big mistakes. And these are things where most people make mistakes when they're negotiating. So I'm going to jump to fear. Nicole touched on it when she said that I didn't have the confidence. When you talk about lack of confidence, what you're really talking about is fear. So in the chat box, fear of what? When I tell you that I was afraid, I was afraid to negotiate, I was afraid to talk about money, what was I really afraid of? So in the chat, just think about it, that situation, what do you think I was afraid of? Rejection. Number one, I was afraid of rejection. Losing my job, yes. And the truth is, if you push too hard and you ask for an outlandish amount of money, you will lose the deal and they could potentially pull the offer. So there's an art to this. It's small part science, large part art, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, so I was afraid of those things. I was afraid they'd turn me down. Embarrassment. That moment, if you ask for, gosh, you know, thank you so much for the offer. I'm excited to start with you on Monday. Out of curiosity, is there any chance that you could give me $3,000 more. My commute's going to be long, and um, that would just really help me out a lot. What if they said no? What if they looked at me and said, what, are you crazy? Do you know how little experience you have? Do you know what a risk you are? Fear of embarrassment. Fear of arrogance. Did anybody get that? No. Okay. So fear. None of us like to think about being afraid. And we all like to think I'm big and I'm grown up and I don't get scared anymore. I'm just going to push through it. I'm just going to stuff that anxiety down. The truth of the matter is when you start to feel anxious, you are afraid of something. And the sooner you're willing to stare that fear in the face and figure out exactly what it is that you're afraid of and then handle it and prepare for it, the more successful you'll be. I promise you, because I've learned the hard way, if you stuff it and you just cross your fingers and hope they don't ask me a hard question, like how much money do I want to make, A, it's going to happen, and B, you're going to choke. So what are you afraid of? As you Clearly you came today for a reason. You're either negotiating a raise, you want a promotion, um, you want a corner office. Maybe some of you are here because you want to negotiate with your current boss about more flexibility at work. Whatever brought you here today, I want you to think about that big moment and in the chat box, share with me, what's the worst that could happen to you if the negotiation doesn't go well? What are you afraid of? Judgment. Yes. What else? Afraid that you'd lose your job. And I, I have seen it happen. Again, if people don't negotiate effectively and they push too hard at the wrong time in the wrong way, they lose their job. Something funny? Oh, being blackballed. It happens. Oh, my gosh. Now, dirty little secrets. I started my own business 10 years ago. Do you know why? I'd been recruiting for two global consulting firms and another company. And when I was working for those companies, my hands were tied. And I had to give rejection reasons to candidates on the safe side. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We found a candidate who was a better fit for our needs. When the truth of the matter is, the dude was a jerk. He pushed really hard on the side. He was rude to the receptionist. He was really aggressive in the negotiations. And everybody in the group and the hiring group said, whoa, dude, we don't want to work with you. Too aggressive. So the fear of being blackballed, it happens. Now that I have my own business, I can tell you the truth. People get blackballed. I know who the people are in my market that have been blackballed that nobody wants to hire. They're a bull in the china shop. So the fear of being blackballed is a legitimate concern. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to figure out what might get you blackballed and work to avoid it? Um, coworkers judging me. Starting off on the wrong foot with a new employer. Yes. So... Absolutely. When you're stepping into negotiation, you've got to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and think about what do you want out of it? What do they want out of it? What's the win-win so that you don't, so that they don't hire you under pressure and regret it. And every, you don't want somebody, every time they look at you thinking, man, she was too expensive. I wish we hadn't given her that much money. We should have turned her down and hired somebody cheaper. That's not good either. Um, funny story along those lines. I was helping somebody negotiate about a year or so ago, and he wanted 30% 30, 30 more than anybody they'd ever hired in the history of the company. And he's worth it. He's really good. He's a PA, physician assistant, working in an orthopedic um, clinic, and he's been doing orthopedics for 20 years. He's really stinking good. He's worked in ERs. Um, so he was worth it. 
but he was above market and he was above what this clinic had ever paid. So anyway, I helped him work on the whole thing. He negotiated, he got the job. And then he called me three months later and he said, oh my gosh, they paid me this, but the expectations of me are so much higher than anybody else on the team. It is nuts. And I am dying over here. And I said, okay, repeat after me, breathe in, breathe out, remind yourself what you bring to the party. And I want you to do whatever you got to do every day going into the war zone to psych yourself into this. You are good enough. You're worth it. You're good enough. And you're going to figure it all out. So he called me a year later and said, I made it. But that fear of um, being only motivated by money or that you're too expensive and then they regret hiring you. Good group today. You guys don't need me. I can just get home. Go home. Um, all right. So. If I haven't touched on them and you haven't touched on them, then let me just quickly capture the top four fears. Everything we've talked about falls into one of these four buckets. Number one, fear of failure. They'll yank the offer. They won't make me an offer because I'm too expensive. Number two, rejection. What makes you think you're worth that? Embarrassment kind of wraps into that. Uh, number three, arrogance. Number four, success, which is what happened to Cameron. I'm a, I'm a little bit of a quote monger. I collect quotes. I've got my favorites up on my bulletin board to inspire me, inspire me on a daily basis. So here's one of my favorite fears, and it is up in bold on my bulletin board because I st I'd like to tell you I never get scared anymore. I still get gripped by a little bit of, sometimes a lot of anxiety when I am calling a really big fish, an important client that I really want in my business, and we're going to talk about money. I get that anxiety welling up. So I look at this quote by Brendan Francis. Many of our fears are tissue paper thin and a single step will break you right through them. And that's been my experience um, since graduating from Longwood is that every time I psych myself up into this hot mess because I'm so worried about what can happen, it ends up being no big deal. So stop doing that to yourself. Get a strategy and I'm going to share mine with you here in a little bit. The cost of staying quiet and sitting back and taking my parents' approach. I work really hard. If they wanna keep me, if they wanna get me, they're gonna just pay me what I'm worth. Here's what's gonna happen if you sit in that camp. It's the ugly truth, but you gotta hear it. Over 10 years, so the average um, household income is 52, around 52,000. So the average individual in America earns less than that. That's going to add up. So if you don't negotiate and you take a little bit below market value, cumulatively, you're going to lose $34,000 in lost wages every 10 years. Well, that hurts, but that doesn't hurt too much, right? Three grand per year. Well, it's more likely a cumulative $64,000 because if you don't negotiate the first time you're going in, you're probably not negotiating at every increase either. So it starts to accumulate and you start to fall further and further behind. But the number that I really want to share with you, and they've... Um, Pinkley and Northcraft in an excellent book that you, if you're interested in this topic, you should read. It's called Get Paid What You're Worth. They studied a whole bunch of people and they followed people right out of college. And they followed people who negotiated just a little bit. On average, these people were only negotiating three to 4% more than their peers. Over the course of a lifetime, the people that just chose to negotiate a little bit earned over $1 million more throughout their life. That is painful. So next time you're thinking, oh, it's okay, I don't need more money, remember that. And find the courage to stand up and step into this a little bit. There are some other costs. So if this is not enough to motivate you, there are some other costs to failing to negotiate. And for those of you that are job hunting and that's why you're here, I want you to especially think about this. Number one, there's a dirty little secret. If you ask for less money, again, whether it's a job or a house or whatever it is, there's an immediate perception that you're worth less. Let me explain that a little bit. Um, we're all nice people, right? I know that, especially the Lancers online with us right now. Um, we're all nice people. And you would think that if you underbill yourself, somebody's going to say, oh, my goodness, um, gosh, he's just not really valuing himself. We should give him a little bit more money and let him know what he's worth. That's not what happens. Human nature is, and I've watched this hundreds of times on the hiring side of the desk to candidates. Let's assume, and I've had candidates, they graduated from the same schools, they had the same level of experience. Very often I was talking with two or three candidates from the same competitors, 
if this one asks for more money, the behavior is, huh, I wonder why she's worth more money. What did we miss? And they start looking for ways to justify why she's worth more money. But the one that asks for less more money, rather than saying, I wonder what he misses, they say, oh, I wonder what we missed. I wonder why he's worth less money than her. Is there a, did he get fired in there and we missed it? I know, it's ugly, isn't it? It's just human nature. So know that, and then there's something else that you need to know. For those of you that are negotiating for positions where you're gonna be responsible for money, P&L, budget, anything like that, if you don't negotiate on your own behalf, employers are gonna be concerned that you're not gonna be able to negotiate well for them. So even if you're just going in for a position as a receptionist, and you're negotiating with the office supply company, the company is gonna be concerned that you're gonna pay overpay for pencils. Honestly, this is what happens in the heads of people on the hiring side of the desk. So are you convinced that you showed up for the right webinar today? I hope so. So let's get into basics. And you guys actually know this, so I am just gonna run poll number three. Paige is gonna launch it for us. What do you think are the critical success factors in any negotiation? And hopefully this is a click all that apply. Can they click? Yeah, multiple choice page is good. All right, so all that, check all that apply for a successful negotiation. What are really critical components to a successful negotiation? Such a smart group, look at that. Do, 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 do. All right. Good group. You've picked all of them. So, and that's absolutely true. So we've got, is it 63% said it's a discussion? 75 said both, both sides need to feel listened to. There's a human emotional element to this that you cannot forget. And then number three, 75%, both sides are content with the results that it feels like a win-win. Nice work. Nice work. Okay. I have an exercise for you. Okay. So what I'd like you to do is think about your last negotiation. To help you out, I'm gonna tell you about my most recent negotiation with my kids. So I have two boys, they're amazing. They're 11 and 12, fifth and seventh grade. But sometimes they give me a little bit of pushback on things like screen time. So like all good parents, I'm concerned about too much technology, too much screen time. So I'm constantly negotiating with them about that. We got two hours a day, and then on the weekends, five hours a day, and they're always trying to get over the, the bridge. So we negotiated about screen time and laundry. So I'm gonna talk about the laundry, because it's more fun than screen time. Gets my blood boiling thinking about the technology thing. So laundry, who likes laundry? Mike, I had a college roommate who loved laundry. She loved laundry so much here at Longwood, she did my laundry for me, I'm not kidding you. I cleaned the room, she did the laundry. She loved it, I don't know why. I do not love laundry, and my boys really don't love laundry. So, but they're 11 and 12, it's time, kick it in. So, I was trying to get my son to do laundry the other day. I wanted him to do it right then. He was finishing up his screen time. He was in the middle of a show that he didn't want to interrupt, and so the negotiation began. I wanted it done right then, he didn't want to do it right then. So, what do you think we did? I took a deep breath, and I said, okay, when would you like to do it? Never. That's not an option. So when would you like to do it? If you want to finish your show, I'll do it at the end of the show. Great. So I got my way. He got his way. We met in the middle, and I was able to just sit on the laundry for another hour. It was just fine. So now that I've talked about something fun and silly, but real life, some of you have joined this webinar, if you're about to graduate, maybe you have never negotiated a salary. Maybe like me, you've been in the restaurant business where you get your, get your hourly rate and that's it. Um, you're here because you're negotiating jobs. I want you to know you've got the skills already. You've been negotiating since you were knee high to a grasshopper. I have been watching my kids with fascination from this big. My 12-year-old has been a shrewd negotiator from this big. He'd figured out how to understand my emotional response, and he started shifting the way he worked with me. So you've got these skills. I want you to think about your latest negotiation in your life. Maybe it was with a roommate, coworker, spouse, for those of you that are a little bit older. Um, number one, what did you want? What did you want? Number two, what did the other person want? Number three, what did you agree upon? What was the outcome? And number four, 
did both of you feel it was a win-win? Did you both walk away feeling good or did one of you feel like you lost a little bit? So I'm gonna let you uh, noodle on that and share. Hopefully somebody will share the situation because it's more fun than me talking at you. Mm. Funny slide. The laundry or the um, lion? What was that movie? I love that movie. Madagascar. Okay. While you're chatting, so Madagascar, um, I own a company called Zebra Backwards, and we help people change their stripes and stand out from the herd. So go watch Madagascar again with a friend or a kid or whatever. There's a really funny moment where the zebra is standing up and they can't tell him from the other herd. And Madagascar story. All right, so laundry. Any negotiations you would like to share? As you're thinking about that, I will jump in and just reiterate, everybody's got to feel it's a win-win. So while you're thinking about sharing your story, because we will all grow and have a great time if you share, and we learn from you, especially those of you that are really shrewd negotiators, I want to hear about your last successful negotiation. Bring it on. Bring it on. All right. Not yet, not yet. While you're thinking, I'm going to share my five-point plan with you, how to get what you want in your next negotiation. Number one, you actually have to figure out what you want. Now, um, most people come back to me and say, well, I want top dollar. I want to get paid what I'm worth. I hear you. But when we talk about negotiation, and I'm going to focus most today on career and salary because that's why most of you are here, I know. Um, so as you think about salary and negotiations, it's not just your raw salary. Is there a bonus involved? If there's a bonus, is it based on your performance, company performance? Does it happen uh, twice a month? Does it happen once a year? So bonus. What about vacation? Is vacation important to you? Um, I was helping a guy recently who had had five weeks of vacation for the last 10 years of his career, and he had a job offer with two weeks vacation. He said, are you kidding me? That was more important to him than the raw salary because he was accustomed to five weeks vacation. It was really valuable to him. Um, commute time, flexible hours at work, healthcare. If you aren't worried about healthcare, you should be. Most healthcare companies are jacking up their premiums this year, 2016, by 20 to 30%. Healthcare is a huge expense. You need to be concerned about it. So number one, when I say know what you want, I mean, what do you need in your life? Bare bones, what do you need in terms of salary and health insurance and those kinds of things to break even on where you were or where you used to be or where you want to be? Um, and then what do you want? So there's what do I need and there's what do I want? What do I, you got to know where your bottom line is because otherwise you're going to get stuck in this vortex of chasing jobs that you can't afford to take and wasting weeks and months. And that's a nightmare. Um, what do you need? What do you want? And what do you want, you need to validate with market research, which is um, number three. What do you need? What do you want? And then I want you to stop and take a deep breath. Breathe in. Breathe out. And I want you to think about why you want what you just wrote down. What you need, what you want. Why do you want that? If you negotiate effectively on your own behalf and you actually get it, like Cameron, he got it, okay? So why did he want that much money? You know what? Because he knew he was going to put in 50 to 60 hours a week in his new position. He'd have an extra commute. There were quality of life things for him. He was really excited about joining this clinic. He was going to be the lead PA. He was going to be responsible for the success of the PAs below him. There were a lot of um, tertiary responsibilities and quality of life impact in taking that job. So it was about more to him than just what do I think I'm worth because I'm really good at what I do. It was about, is it worth leaving the security of my comfortable job that I'm in right now to go off on this new adventure? I'm going to crank up my expectations a little bit to make it worth it to me. So his motivators were more than just money. And yours should be too. Yours should be too. Um, so number three, know your value. We've talked about research. Um, where can you go for, for uh, research? We'll talk about that in a little bit. And number four, discover and negotiate as you go. So a lot of, one of the biggest mistakes people make in negotiations is they sit and wait for the other guy to talk about money. Now I'm going to talk about both, out of both sides of my mouth here. So please listen carefully. A first conversation is like a first date. 
that's where you want to get them to fall in love with you. So if it's a first interview or a first conversation with your boss when you're asking for a raise, it's about warm fuzzies, get them what they need, get them excited about you. So if you're going for a job, first date, you don't want to tell them that you don't squeeze your toothpaste from the bottom of the tube, right? It's all good. No skeletons, no hard talk about money. But by the second date, if the other guy's not talking about money, a lot of experts on negotiation and especially job search advisors are going to tell you the first guy to talk about money loses. Let me tell you reality. The reality is if neither side talks about money until the job offer comes in, things blow up. Here's what I cannot stand. What I can stand is if you ask for what you're worth and they can't afford you or they don't want to pay that to you, okay, at least you tried. What I can't stand is a candidate who's so excited, it's their dream job. They really want to work at Apple. And Apple, it's their dream candidate. They really want them on board and nobody talks about money. And they both think they're in love with each other. Apple tosses them a ring and, and the guy looks at the job offer and says, are you kidding me? That's what you offered me? And either walks away, A, walks away and the deal is blown, B, tries to come back and ask for more money and they can't get it at that stage, or C, takes the job and regrets it. That's what happens when nobody talks about money until a job offer is extended. So the magic sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. And we're going to talk about what to say and how to say it. I know I'm on my soapbox. I get a little fired up about this because that, you know, again, thousands of interviews and, and when it's not a good fit for money, for whatever reason, good. I'm glad we dodged a bullet. But when it's a perfect fit and things blow up because everybody was too afraid to talk about the hard stuff, that to me is heartbreaking for everybody. So you've got to discover and negotiate as you go. And then last, which I also didn't do as that rookie recruiter, flight attendant turned recruiter, I didn't plan or practice how I was going to respond to the money question. I did not at all. And if your anxiety rises when you get in negotiations, you've got to practice the conversation. You have to anticipate their objections. You have to anticipate their rejections and practice what you're going to say. Practice breathing. The best way to do that is with another human being. Find somebody you know and trust. So it could be, if you're still at Longwood, please take advantage of your career services center. Oh my, do you know what career services looked like when I was here 23 years ago? It was a student assistant and a file cabinet with paper jobs. Yeah, that was career services for me. I am, I am so impressed with what Longwood is doing for their students and their alumni. Take advantage of it. Um, practice. Ask if they have a few minutes to practice talking about money with you. You can even do it over the phone, which is a great thing to do because a lot of the times you're going to be on a phone screen talking about money. So let's dive into each of these a little bit, but I'm going to pause for a moment and ask Paige if we have any burning questions. So Jason brought up a question about his negotiation. He says he always has to negotiate with his friends and his partner about restaurant bills instead of just going that or insisting on paying the bill, he offers to pay and promises that next time he can go out so we guarantee another date for another appointment. And who's that, Jason? Jason. Okay, Jason, um, you don't need my help. You are you are oiled for life. That I do that all the time too. It's a great strategy. So you're hitting all sorts of uh, birds with that one stone. You're negotiating effectively. You are creating a, a warm, fuzzy feeling with everybody, and you're setting up a next meeting with them. I do that all the, all the time in my business. When I'm meeting with somebody that I want to maintain a relationship with, I do that as well. So nicely done. Other thoughts, comments? Okay. So let's dive into this a little bit more. Know what you want. I've run through, I think, all of this, but let me just remind you. When you're step one, thinking about what you want, you need to think about more than just the money. For any of you that have been out there working for a while, you know what it's like to wake up in a job that you don't really enjoy. And when you're not paid what you're worth or the commute stinks or they're rigid on the hours, you've got to punch the time clock, those things affect your joy. And I haven't said it yet, but joy and fun at work is critical. You deserve it, number one. Number two, you're going to be at your best when you're having fun at work and you feel good about your compensation. Fun at work. Hold on to it with all your might. If you are not having fun, you gotta ask yourself why not and do something about it. So what you want, 
job title. Sometimes people are really hooked on job titles. If you've been a director, um, you may not want to step down into a manager role and on and on. So think about job title. Think about duties and responsibilities. A lot of times in your career, you are going to be shifting positions. And sometimes you're going to be stepping up. Sometimes you're going to be stepping down. You may be jumping industries and make, you may make a conscious decision that you want to take a step down in terms of responsibility because you're going to be learning so much more. Or maybe you're going to be doing more consulting and collaboration, more research. There are a lot of ebbs and flows in your career where you're going to step and step, step up and step down. Pay attention to that. You've got to be mindful of are you stepping up, stepping down, stepping left. Number two, full-time versus contract. And we're going to have a little bit of time to talk about um, money and how that breaks out. Get out your pens. Let me tell you how that breaks out quickly because – Almost 40% of Americans are working something other than a full-time salary job right now. Let me say that again. Almost 40% of Americans are working something other than a full-time salary job. When I got into the consulting business in 1997, a long time ago, um, it was about 18%. So we've gone from about 18% up to almost 40%. You cannot afford to ignore contract work. And a lot of you just got the hairs went up on the back of your neck because you want a full-time salary job because that's what my parents did. That's what I want. That's more secure. No, it isn't. If you don't believe me, I want you to just turn around in a circle and see out of everybody you can touch how many of them have been laid off, whacked, right-sized, downsized, especially among your parents. Oh, my gosh. Um, the days of job security are gone. Every job really is temporary, whether you're getting paid on a full-time salary basis or a contract basis. Um, how it breaks down. If you, your frame of reference is a full-time salaried position and you want $30,000 a year, the way to break that into a contract hourly rate is this. Let's call it 50 k because it makes my math easier. So if you're looking at $50,000 a year, the average person works 40 hours a week, two weeks vacation, that's 50 weeks. That's 2,000 hours per year. Take your salary or your desired salary, divide it by 2,000 hours. That's your hourly rate. If you take a contract gig at that hourly rate, so 50K, that's 25 bucks an hour, you're going to be crying over a uh, warm beer because that's not enough money. When you are looking at contract work, you have to offset a few things. You have to offset the lack of paid vacation, the lack, often the lack of healthcare benefits, a little bit of less security. If you're taking a contract position, you're guaranteed to be having to hunt for that next job. You might have some downtime, unemployed time in between gigs. You've got to offset that. The cost of health insurance. If you're self-employed and run your own business like I do, even as a contractor, you're going to have to take out your own personal health insurance, and that is expensive. So what you need to do is add 30 to 50% minimum on top of that 25 bucks an hour. So mathematicians in the room, what's 30% on top of 25 bucks an hour? We have a live audience here today too. 750, 3250. So if you are accustomed to $50,000 a year or that's what you're expecting, you need to be asking for 3250, right? 3250 per hour. Hmm? That's 30%. 30% 30 is 3250. So bare minimum, you need to make 3250. When you're negotiating, I want you to go in and ask for at least 35 and give them some wiggle room to come down. That's the quick and dirty on full-time versus contract. All right. Compensation, benefits, growth and advancement opportunity, training and education, flexibility, commute. These are things that often come into a negotiation around career, and you need to think about what's important to you, and then you need to rank them in order of importance. So to those of you that have our online system, there's a section in there, there's a video, and there's an exercise called the Job Hunt Scorecard. It's a little tool to help you rank all these things. For those of you that don't have our system, that's okay. Get out a piece of paper and jot them down, and rank them in order of importance. So for an exercise, I want you to jot down why you want. So I want you to think about that next big thing you want to negotiate for. Is it a job? So it's a salary compensation. Is, is it that? Are you negotiating with your wife to take a weekend off and go hunting? I don't know. What's that next big negotiation? Yeah. What's that next big negotiation you want to make? And I want you to answer three questions. What will you get if you ask for what you want and need? What's the upside for you? What's in it for you to go for it and dare and ask for what you need and want? Number two, what does that win look like? What will your life look like if you get that thing you want? 
And then number three, similar. So what's the win to you and what will, your, what will your life look like? So think about that. And if you're willing to share, which I would love for you to share, um, let us know what is it that you want and what is your life going to look like on the other side if you get what you want. Let's see if anybody's playing along. Jason always has to negotiate with friends and partner about restaurants. Um, so that's that one. So nobody said anything. Okay, bring them on if you have stories to share. I hope you take this away and really think next time you're entering into it. Why did, is it just is it just an ego thing? Do I just want my kids to do the laundry right now because I'm the mom and because I said so? My parents always said to me because I said so and I hated that. I hated that as a kid. And sometimes I catch myself saying that to my kids. And you know what? It wasn't a great, it is true, it's my house, blah, blah, blah. But my kids don't respond well to that when I say because I said so. So I have to think about what's in it for me? What do I really want? I want the laundry folded and put away nicely in their closets. Does it really matter if it happens right this instant or if it happens two hours from now? As long as it's done by the end of the day, I'm, I'm good with that. So I have to think about my, what do I really want? I want the laundry put away and I don't want to have to be the one to do it. Um, am I willing to wiggle on when they get it done? Yes. So Elizabeth says, to get a new job that will allow me to move to a better place and allow me to move to Portland. I love Portland. Great. And one day follow my dreams of have a horse. I grew up on horseback. What kind of a horse do you want? I grew up on quarter horses. Mm -hmm. What kind of a horse do you want? And Paige, Paige, yeah, Paige Rollins has got a horse. And what kind of a horse do you have, Paige? I forget. I'm an Arabian. Oh, my goodness. So she not only has a beautiful horse, she also knows how to handle a horse. She's got an Arabian with a lot of fire. Elizabeth has a horse. Oh, yay, Elizabeth. Okay, so see, now we're kindred spirits and you have to connect with me on LinkedIn. You want a quarter horse? I grew up on quarter horses. Um, so I'd love to connect with all of you on LinkedIn, not just Elizabeth. But um, great. So Elizabeth, hold on to that. Hold on. In fact, vision boards can be really powerful. Make yourself a vision board with a beautiful quarter horse with you on it, galloping across the plains or the mountains of Portland. Get a vision in your head of what you want to give you the motivation and the confidence to go after it. Go get a job in Portland right now. Don't settle for Seattle. Go get a job in Portland. You gotta stand up and go out and get it. And you're gonna need some money for a horse because they are expensive. So you gotta crank up your negotiation. Um, was there another one? All right, nice, love it. That's what I'm talking about. So number three, know your value. This is so hard. How do you know? I'm going to tell you why it's hard. Number one, how can you know what you're worth if you haven't been on the hiring side of the desk like me and, and been privy to hundreds and actually thousands of salary conversations and pr promote? How could you know what you're worth? Number two, there's something else tricky about it. It depends. I'm going to say that again, maybe a little louder. It depends. I could show you dozens of examples right now of people who are perfectly matched in terms of skills, experience, education, and what they perform, what they deliver at work, perfectly matched, who have a 20 to 30% differential in their salary. Sometimes when we're getting up to the upper echelon, we're talking about people having a $50,000 difference in what they take home at the end of the year because this person didn't negotiate and this person did. Um, also, it varies from industry to industry. It varies from company to company. So figuring out what you're worth is tricky because it depends. Here are some ways for you to go figure it out. Number one, online. Salary.com, Indeed.com, Glassdoor.com. Um, other places to go online. So those are some great places to go. Some other places to go are every single industry has associations associated with it that do annual salary surveys. So the American Marketing Association does an annual salary survey. Um, Dice.com is an IT job board. They do an annual salary survey. Robert Half International is a huge, successful uh, staffing firm that is in the trenches every single day negotiating pay for clients and candidates. And they do annual salary surveys in finance, marketing, um, legal, IT. So go to roberthalf.com and Google annual salary survey, Robert Half, um, American Marketing Association, for instance. A couple of other ways, and you can't skip these steps, you guys. You cannot, oh, other resources online. 
Department of Labor, Occupation Net is a tremendous resource. Just Google Occupation Net, and you're going to get the Department of Labor a site which lists every job across America, required education skills, and salary data by region. It is incredibly powerful, and it's going to give you some good insight into what the pay bands are for various jobs. The third thing I'm going to say to you is you have got to talk to every single recruiter, that's me, every recruiter that you talk to, when they're about to turn you down and say, thanks so much, but you don't have what we're looking for, say, hang on a second, Tony, thank you so much for the call. I'm sorry I'm not a fit, but while I have you on the phone, what should my salary expectations be for a position like this? When you have a recruiter on the phone, take advantage of their real-time industry expertise and ask them what they're seeing right now in your market for your level of experience. There's a fourth bullet that I can't believe I have on, don't have on here, which is to talk to people that are in the industry. Culturally, Americans do not like to talk about money. My husband is from South Africa, and he always marvels at how people get freaked out when he says to them, oh, I like that car. How much did you pay for it? Did he just ask me that? Yeah, why not? You don't do that in this country. And so um, people do not grow up learning how to talk about money. And so it's really uncomfortable to ask your neighbor who's in a job that you would love to have, so how much money do you want to make? There are other ways to do it. You can say, hey, John, you have a couple of minutes. I'm looking, as you know, I'm looking for a job in operations, and I would love to talk to you about what you really do, how'd you get your job, get any advice you have for me on how to get a job like that, and see if you have any good connections for me or resources. And he says, yes, you'll say, I'll make you dinner, come on over. When you're sitting there with him, say, by the way, John, I have no idea what I'm worth. Like, I don't know what to ask for for salary. What are you seeing right now for people in operations? See, it's a little gentler than saying, how much money do you make? You can ask him, what does he think my value is in this market? Some people are going to freak out and run away from you. Most people with that question are going to tell you what they think you should be asking for. Number three, your own pay history. It is so important for you to know what you've been accustomed to, not just pay, compensation. How many times have I seen people who were so focused on just the paycheck, they forgot about health care, 401k, paid vacation, um, gym membership, and all of the bells and whistles, and then they take the new job and they wake up and say, oh my gosh, I left $5,000 on the table. I'm making $5,000 less than I used to with all those things. Ouch. So you need to look at what you're accustomed to and where you've been. Plus. In an interview, a lot of people are going to ask you how you used to be paid because they want to know if you're going to be happy or if you're going to be a flight risk. There's some food for thought. Number four, discover and negotiate. And I'm watching the time and I want to take questions. So let me motor through the rest of this. Discover and negotiate every step of the way. Um, ask the hard questions, pre-close the deal, and be objective. That list of what's important to you that I asked you to do earlier, I want you to make that list of what's important to you. I want you to hold on to it, and I want you to reference it consistently throughout your job search. Every step of the way, come back to your scorecard and look at, do I know what the answer, am I going to get this? Are they going to pay for me to get training? What is my vacation? And by the time you're getting close to getting an offer, if you don't have answers to those questions, it's time to start asking those hard questions. And then I've talked about number five, plan and practice. Grab a friend, grab a buddy, better yet, grab a professional in the industry who knows what they're talking about and do a mock interview and practice talking about money with them and negotiation until you feel more comfortable, until you don't want to throw up anymore. Then you know you're practiced and you're ready if you don't want to throw up anymore, okay? A little anxiety is good, wanting to throw up, not good. So what to say? I have some scripts for you. Next time you're going into a salary negotiation, here are some ideas for you of what to say. And I've used these over and over and over again, and they work. Option A, if it's a first date, if it's a first date, a phone screen, a first interview, I want you to delay. I want you to stall and say something like, remember to breathe and smile. Susan, that's a great question. I am more than happy to talk with you about money, um, but it'd be really helpful to know a little bit more about the position before I do. I don't want to either overprice or underprice myself. So can you tell me a little bit more about the role and the responsibilities? That would be really helpful. Stall number one. If that doesn't work and they say, no, I want you to tell me how much money you're going to make or you want to make, and some people are going to push you right up there, um, then option B, breathe, 
smile. Money is certainly important to me, but it is not number one on my list. It's not the only factor. Um, out of curiosity, what is your budget for this position? What does your compensation look like? And then zip it, smile, and breathe. It's probably going to be a big pregnant, uncomfortable pause at this time. That's okay. Still stay quiet and wait and let them come back. Most people at that time are going to come back and tell you what their range is. Some are going to play hardball and they're not going to tell you. Big mistake on their part. Nothing you can do about it. Here's what you do when they push you and you still don't know what their budget is. You smile and here is what you say. You don't say, I want this. You say, all right, I'll talk about money. You know, I've been out talking to some other companies. Hint, hint, you ain't the only game in town. So I've been out talking to some other companies, and what I'm seeing in the market is a range between 30 and 50,000, 100 and 130, whatever it is, and say to them, your competitors and my market research are telling me that positions like this pay in this range, and then flip it back to them. How does that fit with your budget? Do you see the sweet thing I'm doing here? You still haven't told them what your bottom line is because you want them to cough it up first. All right? So option A, option B, option C. And then option D, when they push you and they want a number from you and they say, what's your bottom line? You're going to be ready for it because you have done your homework, you have planned and practiced, and you're going to smile and you're going to say to them, I'm looking for something in the range of this. And then you're going to be quiet and say once again, John, how does that fit with your budget? And then be quiet and breathe. All right, there are a couple of scripts for you. All right, Dr. Berger, all right, all right, there we go. I just saw him today. Did any of you have Dr. Berger? Any social majors out there? He was so much fun. He taught me some of the most important lessons in my life that I still carry with me now. It's really fun. So when you succeed, whether it's with your kids or your next salary negotiation, when you succeed, Try not to look astonished, okay? You can be excited, but try not to jump up and down like a crazy loon because then they're going to think, oh my gosh, I paid her way too much. Paige, poll number four. How are you feeling right now about your next negotiation? Are you feeling awesome, ready to go, or still a little bit nervous? A little check on how you're all feeling. Good, much better. Still nervous, but I can do it. Notice I did not give any of you an option to say I'm still freaked out because you should not be. You can do this, all right? So in closing, let me wrap it up and hopefully we'll have a minute or two for questions. Key lessons that I want you to walk away with today. Number one, if you don't ask, you won't get it. Sorry, mommy and daddy, it's true. Number two, you've got to make sure you be thinking about what's the win-win for both sides. Number three, fear is your biggest enemy. Stand up, look that baby in the eye, and handle it. Acknowledge it, love it up, and get ready to walk through your fear. Help me on today. First place you need to go, those of you that are students, and I know you're out there, you are on campus right now at Longwood, you need to walk into the Career Services Department and ask for help. They are smart, they know what they're doing, take advantage of it. All right. I have some help for you beyond a day. So I can't be in 59 places at once and I can't have coffee with everybody that I meet, but I want to help every single one of you. So five years ago, there was nothing on the market like this, so I built it. Um, we built an online job hunt coaching system. It's got over 50 short videos, 30 exercises. It is job search A to Z. It, it really takes the pain out and it'll tell you how to avoid some of the biggest mistakes. So it's normally $200. Mm -hmm. Today, for you, 20 bucks. So if you, if I didn't drive you nuts and you haven't hopped off the webinar yet because I'm driving you crazy, then you're probably going to like our online videos. We've got some sections in there, how to talk about money. We've got uh, negotiation, a whole bunch of exercises and videos around that. Also interviewing. We've got a whole section on interviewing, how to work with recruiters, how to interview, how to handle references. Uh, so we, job hunt checklist, LinkedIn checklist, um, target sample resumes, target marketing plan, all of the tools and techniques that you need. And it's 20 bucks for you. So if you're lost, if you don't have a program to follow and you need help, you can go to our website right now. We cranked that price down from 220. You can go out there between now and Sunday 
and get it for 20 bucks. And I have a commitment to you. If you don't like it and it doesn't help you, I'll give you your money back. So that's the deal if you're interested. Um, again, our company is Arbez, and if you don't know what that is, it's Zebra Backwards. So I'm gonna wrap it up with, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you are smart, you are talented, and you are worth it. Be brave, be confident, and go out and ask for a little more money than you're comfortable asking for, and you just might get it. I wanna give a huge thank you to Longwood for hosting me. It has been such fun. I got here Wednesday afternoon. Really excited to be an alumni of Longwood. I'm proud of Longwood. Um, they made me who I am. And I'm on LinkedIn, Catherine Byers Breet. I'd love to help you, connect with you. Please find me out there um, and go chase your dreams. Thanks for joining us. And is it the top of the hour? It is. Do we have to go? No. Let's take some questions. Bring them on. Let's bring the questions on. Come on, everybody. Yeah. After being in a job where you were in the debt, when you negotiated salary upon being hired, how long should you wait before asking for a raise? Ooh, good question. So Ellen wants to know, you took a job, you're kind of happy, but you want more money. Uh, three months later, you can ask for a raise. I'm totally kidding. Oh my gosh, have I watched way too many people three months in think they can go and ask for, you know, 10 more bucks an hour and they wonder why they lose their job. Not three months. Uh, six months, sometimes you can go in at the six month mark but you better make sure that you've really delivered above and beyond. You have outperformed their expectations of you and you got to practice and prepare your case studies and get ready to go in and talk to them. You don't lead in and say, I want more money. So whether this is at the six month mark or the 12 month mark, you can certainly go in and ask for more money at the 12 month mark. You should ask for an annual review, ask your boss to sit down and review and prepare for that review by talking about what you've accomplished, getting very clear, share that first, and then once your boss looks at you and says, oh my gosh, I'm so happy we hired you, then you can say, I'm so glad you said that because I've been doing some research out there and realized that I'm actually, there's actually a little more money out there in the market for this kind of role and the work that I'm doing. Can we talk about a raise? Six months is the earliest, 12 months, absolutely appropriate. What are your best tips for internal raise negotiations, especially after a bad financial year? Dustin, what a great question. So Dustin uh, has experienced, and this happens all the time, you guys. Companies uh, ebb and flow. They have good years, they have bad years, and uh, I've lived through two recessions now, getting up there in age. I've lived through two recessions, and the reality is sometimes budgets, uh, companies flat out cannot give raises. That's one side of my mouth. The other side of the mouth is, in that climate, there are always people getting raises. Top performers continue to get raises every single year, regardless of the raise, the freezes on raises. So that's the dirty little secret that you now know. And the way to get it is, first of all, go through my five-step plan. Know why you, what you want, why you want it, what you're worth in the market. Go do your research. And then when you sit down with your boss to ask for a raise, be sensitive to the climate. Be sensitive to the fact that they're hurting financially. Do the whole... How am I performing? What can I do better in my job? How can I help you, boss Tom? How can I help you be more successful? Once you've done that, and he knows that you care about his success as much as you do about your own, then say, I know that we're in some financial struggles right now. Um, I'm just wondering, what is the chance of getting a little bit of a bump in my salary? And then before you apologize for asking and say, I know, I know, stop yourself. Acknowledge they're in a bad financial situation and then say, what are the chances of me getting a raise in my salary right now? And then be quiet and breathe and smile and see how it goes. So good luck to you. Um, I hope you get it. All right, and our last question. I was hired into a position and told that in the interview, I would move into the supervisor position when my boss retired. At the time, it was only he and I. Now I have a team of four and he is getting ready to retire. I've been told that it's a possibility that I may not get the position. How would you recommend a negotiation for this? Shame on that person that hired you and set false expectations. That's why I started my business. That's why I do consulting, teaching companies how to be better in the hiring process. So number one, they should have never made the promise. Um, they now have a, uh, an employee, you, who has every right to be upset. You have a right to be upset. They made a promise that they are now not going to deliver on. Now I understand why. The game has changed. The, the department is larger. There are three other parties involved here. And um, I don't have time here 
chatting to find out what it is that those people have that you don't, I want you to figure that out. So I want you to take a deep breath and go home over the weekend and, and I want you to literally look at yourself. What have you accomplished since you started there? What is the job really that you would be taking? What is that director role? Um, what are the roles and responsibilities? You need to look really honestly at what you're missing. What are the gaps, the experience, the skills that maybe you don't have yet? And then I want you to look at those other three people. What do they bring to the party? Now I'm going to tell you that they may, maybe, let me make some assumptions just for example. Maybe they have more experience than you. That doesn't mean they'll be a better promoter than you, better promotion than you. I was promoted to director at 27 and I was, I, I had people that I was managing that were 20 and 30 years older than me, really uncomfortable. And I had to do a lot of um, work to get my head around that game, but they promoted me because I had demonstrated a uh, tremendous passion for grooming rookie recruiters and the other people on the team hated rookie recruiters. <laughs> they didn't have any interest in that whatsoever. So that was one of my uh, aces in the hole. Um, and there were some other reasons why I ended up getting a promotion over them. One of them quit because she didn't like reporting to me and that's okay. The rest of them stayed and I ended up building the best company team in the company. So please don't just take it lying down. Try to figure out what they have that you don't, what are the gaps, and then sit down with your boss that's retiring. If you have a good experience with them, sit down and get their advice and say, I understand that I'm now competing with three other people. I would really love your suggestions on what I can do to be the one that they pick. Take your boss off campus, out to lunch or breakfast, pay for it, and say, I would really, I admire you, I respect you, and I could really use your advice. Can you give me some advice here on how to get that position? What am I missing? What do I need to do? So good luck. I hope you get it. Is that it? All right. Thank you, everybody. It's been great having you here today. Enjoy your weekend and go Lancers. Awesome. I'm going to slip right here next to you. Paige. Hi, thank guys. You. All right. Thank you so much for being Absolutely. here today. And thank you, everyone who's tuned in to Career Chats Live. Um, we hope that you guys learned a lot today. And if you still have questions that you'd like to be answered, make sure you connect with us on LinkedIn, the Longwood Network, as well as on social media using at Longwood Alumni and hashtag Career Chats Live. Um, so this has been sponsored by the Office of Institutional Advancement and brought to you by the Office of Alumni and Career Services on campus. And for the first ever time on campus, we're having a Longwood Giving Day on March 4th. So no matter where you are, um, near or far, there's always opportunities for prizes and to show your Longwood spirit. Hey, even $25 counts. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just our shameless plug. And we hope to see you guys at the next Career Chats Live, which is two Fridays from now at 1 p.m., same time, same place, with John Hill, a former LinkedIn employee, so he knows all the secrets, as well as he's a networking pro. So learn how to be a networking strategist there. And we hope to see you guys soon.